It's that time again, Our Town Live, where friends, family, people you know, share with us their unique bits of wisdom. And now, here's Herb, your host, for another show. Dr. Caleb Burks, DVN. Dr. Burks is a local veterinarian who will answer questions about pets and the coronavirus. He's an associate veterinarian at Riverstone Animal Hospital, Athens, Georgia, a graduate of the University of Georgia, working in small animal general practice in Canton, Georgia. He enjoys client interaction and education and enjoys using these traits as an opportunity to help put clients at ease and clarify the situation of their pets. He works well with others and enjoys contributing to a friendly and cooperative workplace. He strives to offer the highest quality of care and endeavor to make the best of any situation and improve through his efforts every day. He likes to keep busy and have mind occupied, especially by taking on personal projects and using his organization skills to improve the functioning of his workplace. Let's meet Dr. Caleb Burks. I am a small animal veterinarian uh, working in Canton, Georgia at Riverstone Animal Hospital. Uh, been in practice for a couple of years now, but uh, recently moved to the area. Do you have your own practice or do you work for somebody? Uh, I work for somebody. I'm an, an associate. What's the name of the firm you work for? Riverstone Animal Hospital. And where are they located? Uh, in Canton, uh, on Bluffs Parkway. That's Canton, Georgia, I'm assuming? Yes. Okay, fine. I'm going to get right to the point because of what's going on today. So I've had lots of questions that hopefully I want a few answers from a local veterinarian. First question. Should I have a preparedness plan for my pet or pets? Yes, I think that's a good idea, really, in any sort of potential, you know, difficult situation, be it natural disasters and stuff like that. You know, uh, years back, we had the Hurricane Katrina and all the fallout from that. And there was a lot of people with their pets trying to, you know, find shelter out of state or get care and stuff like that. So uh, what I recommend is to you know, have up-to-date rabies tags. Uh, have an ID tag for your pet with an up-to-date phone number. It also helps if your pets are, are microchipped. Uh, there's a lot of different companies that offer that as a service, but regardless, it really helps to track down the owner of a pet if you get separated from that pet, if they're lost and someone else finds them. Uh, so that's really useful. The other thing I would generally recommend is good to have a written down or uh, something like that, some preserved form of an abbreviated medical history. You know, what diagnosis do each of your pet have? Any medical conditions or major medical events, surgeries, whatever medications they're on, the dose and frequency, just that sort of basic essential information so that if someone else has to care for your pet in an emergency situation, uh, in the current, you know, sort of situation, if you get sick, if you're in the hospital and someone else has to take care of your pet, they know the most important kind of basic information for your pet and how to care for them. A question I'm asked all day long, can my pet get COVID-19? Right. Uh, so that's very unlikely. There are a lot of different coronaviruses that exist, and most of them are species specific. So cats have their own coronavirus, which is very common, actually, uh, and generally doesn't cause many issues. Dogs have a coronavirus of their own, uh, etc. But it's very unlikely that they can catch this specific form. Uh, it has made a jump to humans, but it's 
not terribly likely that it would be you know compatible with dogs and cats and and such like that i have of course seen you know some stuff on social media about you know this dog might have caught covid-19 or whatever but if you really dig into those things it's it's not very solid or information is kind of sketchy so like a lot of stuff on social media should be taken with a big old grain of salt. <laughs> right. A salt lick. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. There's certainly nothing verified as to that. Now, while they cannot catch it, it is theoretically possible that they could transfer it, move it around uh, as what's called a fomite. Um, and a fomite, for anyone who doesn't know, is any sort of physical object that can harbor a uh, bacteria or a virus for a period of time. You know, a, a doorknob, handrail, a keyboard, you know, something that you touch, maybe the virus is on and then you touch your face, you know, lick your hands, <laughs> whatever, before washing it, and you can get the virus in that way. So theoretically, someone with the virus could, you know, pet your, your animal and they could hold the virus in their fur for a while and someone else touching them could catch it in that way. Um, fur is not as efficient of a transfer method as, you know, a normal flat, smooth surface of like a table or a piece of metal, a doorknob. So it's not as likely, but it's theoretically possible. If you've taken your <clears throat> pet out to walk and you come across some people that <laughs> you're, you're suspect of, when you bring your pet home, would it be wise to wash your hands and do all the necessary things they're talking about today? Absolutely. Yeah. So really, in my mind, it shouldn't change anything that you would be doing anyway. You know, wash your hands. Uh, practice some reasonable social distancing, not just with yourself, but with your pets. I mean, maybe now isn't the best time to go to the dog park or, or to go to the groomer. So, you know, if you don't need to do those things, then reasonable to stay at home for it. Uh, but yeah, just wash your hands, take reasonable precautions. Can veterinarians test for COVID-19? Uh, not in pets, no. Uh, but considering our current situation where we don't have any current evidence of it getting into pets, there, there hasn't been a need. Um, so yeah. If one of my listeners was to be diagnosed with COVID-19, how should they protect their pet? In that situation, it depends, I suppose, somewhat on your specific case. I would recommend making sort of the decision early on, if you have the disease or you think you have it, to isolate either you know with your pet or away from your pet. Kind of depending on your situation, uh, you, you certainly don't want to, you know, have interactions with your pet and then your pet then, as a fomite, spread the virus to other people in your family or your household, potentially. Um, of course, if you're hospitalized, you're not going to be able to take your pet with you. So someone else will, will have to care for your pet. Um, but considering the direct risk to your pet isn't, you know, significant, that's not so much the worry as making sure they don't spread it to other people. Should I be concerned about keeping my home clean and safe for my pets? Sure. To to the sort of standard extent. Um, I don't know if you're having house guests over very often these days, but if you do, then <laughs> normal sort of cleaning uh, precautions, I think, would be reasonable. There should be information on the either the CDC websites or the World Health Organization websites about what disinfectants are, are useful and effective for this sort of thing. Uh, so general household hygiene would be a good idea, yeah, especially if you have concerns about contact with, you know, people in your household or who have visited recently and stuff like that. What can we do to help animals and shelters during this crisis? Right. So this probably won't apply to too many people, but... If you do have access to, you know, certain supplies, you know, masks or what have you, 
then donating that sort of thing could be good. At the minute, we don't have shortages of anything like dog food, so that hasn't been an issue. Um, mostly, I would say the biggest thing would be cooperating and respecting whatever procedures your vets or other animal you know, facilities have in place. Um, I mean, for instance, at my hospital, we are conducting most of our appointments from the car. You know, people pull into the parking lot and they call in and we go out, we stand outside the car, we talk about the pet's history, get that information, take the pet inside, do most of that all inside and then, you know, touch base back with the owner again, either by phone or kind of out in the parking lot again. Uh, and so the biggest thing would be trying to you know, understand these limitations at this sort of time and uh, help us to stay healthy so that we can keep, you know, serving you and your pets. I'm sure my listeners are going to have lots of questions and ideally would like to talk to you. How can they contact well, you? Uh, I work currently at Riverstone Animal Hospital and we're happy to see people. Uh, again, like I said, we've made quite a lot of changes to our general procedures to uh, keep things safe, but uh, I, I certainly recommend this. Uh, aside from that, I think it's important to know sometimes what is, you know, what is an essential time to seek some, some veterinary help and how can you do that, uh, particularly if you have concerns about, you know, your, your interactions with other people, if you're sick, or if you're just concerned about getting sick. Um, the most important stuff that I would say if you need, you need to contact a vet for would be you know, profound lethargy in one of your pets, uh, multiple episodes of vomiting, obvious or severe pain, uh, non-weight-bearing lameness, or, or lameness affecting multiple limbs. Uh, toxic ingestion, or worsening of an existing condition that you already know your pet has, such as heart failure or something like that, of course, all should see a vet for. Um, for cats, not eating for more than 24 hours, or if you notice straining to apparently urinate or defecate uh, or panting, uh, are all significant signs uh, that you should definitely go to a vet for. There is... Now, as you might expect in this sort of outbreak time, an increase in people doing what's called uh, telemedicine or telehealth, uh, which has also been growing on the human side, but essentially where you can contact your doctor or a doctor via telephone or something like FaceTime. And that's something that you know, my practice is looking into doing and expanding into, uh, but that everyone could make use of. So there is an app called AirVet. You should be able to get it for Android or, or iPhone sort of devices. And basically what it allows you to do is contact in an emergency a veterinarian somewhere in the United States within a few minutes. And you have a little FaceTime call. Uh, I believe it charges you $30 for doing so. But you have a FaceTime call with a veterinarian who can uh, assess your pet and help you come to a conclusion of, you know, do I need to go to the vet? Is this an emergency or is this something that can you know, wait till the next business day? You know, if you're after business hours or something like that. Um, and certainly you don't want to have to go to the ER uh, for something not necessarily emergent because that can be expensive and, you know, times are difficult right now for sure. Uh, so that can be very helpful. Are there things that a vet veterinarian can see in the FaceTime call looking at the animal over over the internet? So, yes, there, there are things that can be done and things that can't be done, and understanding those limitations is important. So if the app can connect you to your personal veterinarian, if they're a part of that system. And, and that's something that my practice is working on and hoping to roll out soon. But more broadly, if you're connecting to a veterinarian just somewhere to triage your pet for a concern, a potential emergency issue, then they cannot diagnose your pet uh, and they cannot prescribe medications. 
They can only say, you know, I 